This time on Pole Hub, evolution. Not the Charles Darwin type. Well, not exactly, anyway. It's the evolution of polling. Early public opinion polling consisted of people walking around the country knocking on doors. Literally, going town to town, knocking on doors, asking questions. But soon nearly everybody had a telephone, and that revolutionized the industry. Phone polling was pretty much the standard for something like 50 years after that. But in the last decade, polling evolution has sped up. Dinosaurs are dying, and there's a messy mix of polling techniques that have emerged from the wreckage. Which ones are working? Which ones are dodos doomed to extinction? That's what we're going to talk about on Poll Hub. Let's get started. I'm J.D. Dapper, and with us... Uh, Lee Marigov from the Hancock Building at Marist College, director of the Marist Institute for Public Opinion, and... Barbara Carvalho, the director of the Marist Poll. The Hancock Building reference. That was very nice, Lee. Yes, well, it's where we are. It is, and we invite... On Marist College campus. And we invite all of you to come and visit and watch our podcasting. No, we, we don't, actually. Let's stop that right there. <laughs> polling evolution. Um, it's so interesting. When we were talking one time, not that long ago, I did not realize that people actually went door to door, knocking on doors, and that's how original polling was done. We think of polling as telephone polling, people calling on the poll. That's what you guys do. That's the, the best method. That's mm-hmm. kind of the gold standard. Yep. But boy, things are a lot tougher now than they were even 10 years ago, right? Yeah, I think this is an industry which periodically sheds its technological skin to sort of keep up or to advance uh, the way we do things, which are hopefully always accurate and least expensive when we can. I know that George Gallup, way back when, and even before the Maris poll, uh, was doing the door-to-door method, uh, which was a, a way of... Uh, uh, of collecting poll data in a very slow and costly manner. Well, polling polling is kind of a combination of both communications and computer technology. So if you put it in that context and you think about the last couple decades, well, we've had to change a lot. Um, and I think one of the issues is that um, even that technology has changed a great deal. So how we communicate with each other. I mean, now we barely even use a telephone um, because we're mostly texting and emailing and you know, communicating electronically. And that's even, I mean, we, we talk about how the big change from landline to cell phone, but you're even saying that it's not just that people don't have landlines as often, it's that they don't even use their cell phones as phones. And to talk, right, to, to talk, to talk which, to people. Which makes polling, phone polling. Uh, hard, not just because it's you have to reach struggle. cell phones. Yeah. you got to get people to pick up a cell phone when they're going, oh, what is this? Oh, it's ringing. I didn't know it was a phone. So <laughs> let's let's just take one step back, though, because I think one of the biggest changes in polling was the move from landline to cell phones. And the reason why that, that was such a big deal was because there's different regulations in terms of whether and how we can call people depending upon the device we're actually calling. So what happened is that it became much more difficult to reach someone on a cell phone because initially we all thought that cell phones were our own personal device. And so strangers didn't call. The only people who called were people we wanted to call us. And you're, well, you, and you're, you're still, I mean, you still, you get a telemarketer calling on your cell phone. I yep. mean, my reaction is, I, I get mad. Yeah. I mean, I don't pick it up because I see I don't recognize the number. But I get mad when then I hear that voicemail. Oh, oh, Mr. up or you have been selected for that. It's like and the cruise, yes, yes. You, yes. Yeah. The, the wonderful cruise. cruise. <laughs> <laughs> That's not us. That's oh, not yeah. us. Well, That's thank us. you. Yeah. But we. But I think what we're what we're talking about here is a need to recognize that with this changing technology, there's trade-offs, there's risks, there's benefits. And I think Barb's alluding to the fact that when we originally started, well, we were you know doing everything on paper and pencil, and computers entered into our mix. And now that's a very different world because uh, it's all taking place in a in a whole new technological place, and and, and we really have to adjust to that as we uh, as we grow. So you said we were talking about cell phones, the change from landlines to cell phones. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- what makes cell phones so difficult? Because you still, phone pole, it's still the gold standard. Why is cell phones more difficult? What are the regulations? It's more expensive? Well, there's something that, um, there was a regulation that was passed in 1991. It was called the TCPA, the Telephone uh, 
Consumer Protection Act. And the goal behind that was to really protect consumers from unwanted calls. There were people who had, and for those of us who are old enough, had pagers, <laughs> um, you know, people who were, you know, first responders, doctors, people who needed to be um, on call. Reporters. And, Reporters, yeah. it exactly. Was an, an early beneficiary of the pager revolution. Yeah. Breaking news. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, and so, there was an interest in keeping those phone numbers kind of out of the mix. Um, and so, as cell phones though developed and became ubiquitous, um, pretty much everyone now has a cell phone. I think the penetration now is uh, close to ninety percent. Um, we needed to then adapt um, how we called those individuals. Um, people had to pay for minutes. Um, you didn't have an unlimited number of um, minutes to be able to talk on a telephone. So if I'm calling you in for a survey, do I compensate you for that time that you're now spending? Um, and so there were lots of issues, not just the fact that um, people you know, didn't want to be bothered and there was this proliferation of polling going on. So the TCPA eventually in 2015 required us to not... Um, automate um, the dialing of any cell phone. And in the past, although we had had some regulations, that was mainly based on the content. So a telemarketer couldn't call between certain hours. Um, a telemarketer couldn't um, auto-dial cell phones. But researchers could. So there was, a, there was an interest in um, keeping um, research available um, to people, but not other unwanted calls. And the TCPA ruling in 2015 that Barbara alludes to was the first time a decision was made based on technology, not the content. So our research was now thrown in with your telemarketing, and it was all said, you know, this is illegal use of phones. So what did that do to you? It made it much more arduous to do polls. In fact, uh, everything is now being uh, to be in full compliance, manually dialed. So in a sense, we're like a jet plane taxing around the runway, and we never can get up in the air, uh, which is obviously a quicker way to, 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 to move around. And so, so that makes it more expensive. And yes. once you make something more expensive, other polling organizations, all polling organizations, are going to be looking for different yes. approaches, right? And yes. is, that, is that what's happening in terms of the evolution of polling here? Uh, the price is driving this? Yes. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with telephone polling in terms of accuracy, in terms of getting a representative sample, and in finding out what people's opinions are. It's still methodologically. The gold, it's still the gold standard methodologically. It's, it's great. It's just it costs a lot of money and to contact that people slower. that way. So, Lee, what are some of the new polls we see? Uh, online polls, we see um, uh, text polls. I've seen one yeah. of those where they text yeah. you. What are these, and do they work? Are well, they? I mean, you know, in the polling industry, we we talk about different mode effects. You know, how are you reaching folks? And we like to say that not all polls are created equally. So we're seeing a, a, in, we're in an experimental phase as we transition in this new environment. So what do you think of the uh, the, the uh, polls that are based on, on uh, website people or, or, or texts or those kinds of things? Are they, do they work? Are the numbers real? People have been trying to figure out how to replace telephone polling so that they can make polls cheaper and faster. And no one has really solved that yet. Um, we have online polls, and they vary in quality. There have been a number of organizations um, that have tried to develop um, random panels. Survey USA is one of the big ones. Um, well, YouGov is one but of them. YouGov, right? YouGov is one of them. Um, Survey USA actually uses a little bit different methodology. They um, still use interactive voice response, which is the you know the robocalls that uh, we've all grown to to love. But both YouGov and Survey USA, uh, the numbers add up sometimes at least mm -hmm. i mean they're not mm -hmm. they're not crazy bad no, polls. no, no. they make there's a there's an attempt there to actually try to make it representative it's a serious and combine, attempt by serious and to, people and to, to, to develop a method to do this online or using some kind of automation for landlines so that you can at least 
um, reduce the, some of the costs of data collection. And how have they stacked up against the gold standard, which is what uh, we still do, right? The telephone polling. Yeah. And, how I th- they stacked and, up? I, and I think with varying success. And so I think this is still not a proven method, uh, not not an automatic uh, winner. Uh, and, well, well, and I Gallup, think, uh, you know, yeah, Gallup, Gallup did some research in 2016. Yep. And what they did and um, was take a look at all the different ways that they do surveys. Mm-hmm. They had a t- random um, telephone study. They had a panel survey, which means these are people who they have called in the past who then said they can, you know, please call me back. So you can use some kind of automation to call them back. They used web, and then they used this kind of haphazard type of panel where people just opt in, which isn't um, really that representative. And they looked at these four different methods because these are four different ways that people try to identify individuals who might want to participate. And what they found was the telephone survey was still the gold standard. Um, they um, They looked at the Clinton-Trump difference, which nationally was plus two for Clinton because she won the popular vote. And the telephone survey was very close to that. It was 2.8. So um, that was really the best measure of and got the closest understanding of what the election outcome was going to be. The panel, which was the previous people that they had spoken to um, through telephone polls who said that they could, uh, would participate in the future again um, was just a little under four points. But when they looked at the web, in other words, people actually participating in the web, the difference was Clinton plus eight. And then when they looked in that opt-in panel where people, you know, just kind of um, decided that they wanted, they self-selected into this panel, that was Clinton plus 16. So, So, I mean, that's really clear evidence and an indication that these new techniques uh, still have, still in have mass, some, anyway, in, as the bulk, don't really, they have a lot of work to they do. They have some, they're going through a growing pain uh, period, uh, maybe a little still adolescence before they hit their adulthood phase. And but, understand, if, if, we could, if we could connect with folks um, on cell phones, um, when we connect with them that way, if we look at our cell phone sample, it's very representative of the population as a whole. There's, there's nothing methodologically, statistically wrong with any of that. It's just costs a lot of yeah. money. And that's a very, really interesting point. Our samples actually come out cleaner when we're doing more cell phones uh, because we're reaching some of the harder to reach audiences. Uh, so the irony is that the cost increase the, uh, the, the slowdown in our ability to get surveys done quickly um, does result in cleaner samples. So, we're, so there is well, a benefit to this. Yeah, what Lee's talking about is when we look at a sample, we want to be able to make sure that it matches the population that we're talking to. So if we're looking at Americans as a whole, we want to make sure that the people we spoke with represent uh, people of all educational levels, backgrounds, um, ethnic um, diversity and, and certainly regionally and geographically. So when we actually phone by cell phone, well, you know. But but I want to get back to this cost thing because mm-hmm. you know everything everything runs on economics at some point, sure. right? Mm-hmm. And everything is driven by cost at some point, mm-hmm. even even especially in polling because somebody's paying the bill. It is not cheap to poll. If That's people correct. think that. You can do a poll for a hundred bucks. You're crazy. You can't do it. It's well, expensive. you can. You can. <laughs> to get it good, depends. Yeah. It depends upon whether you want but reliable information. It's, it's expensive to do reliable, good Correctly. polls. And yep. so uh, <laughs> there are. An, there's been a proliferation of yes. polls uh, that are out there. And this is a whole different topic. But I just this well, one sliver of it is part of that proliferation of polls a result of the cost going up and therefore fewer and fewer organizations like yes. the Marist Poll able to do no the gold question. standard. Yes. No question, Absolutely. because I think in the past it was media organizations uh, 
particularly for public polls, that would bear the the burden of the cost of that. I, and as as the as the media, um, you know, certainly shrunk in terms of its ability to pay, and polling increased in its in its um, cost, um, you really had this uh, very significant change, particularly with the public polls and during election but here's, season. But here's a real downside to that, and I was just reading uh, recently that Nate Silver of uh, 538 um, talked about the arrival and growth of, dare I say, really fake polls, polls that are done online by organizations who have a political motive, but may be calling themselves data incorporated, and they show up during election time, and they're not really valid survey organizations. They're there to affect the perceptions of how candidates are doing. So you might want to show up as a candidate and their PAC does a poll, and lo and behold, your candidate's doing better, and it affects these real clear averages that people check, and it looks like the candidate's more competitive. So in a sense, this whole discussion does have not only a kind of like a gray hair growing part for us <laughs> pollster types. The but wonky. That was the wonky the, part. The wonky there's part. There's actually a real. There's a real political trap at the end of this. And people have to beware as consumers that not all, to get back to the initial phrase, not all polls are created equally. And the intent of all polls is not necessarily to be accurate. And that becomes very problematic in a, a more in a, a, a very very different way. So yes, there are now fake polls. They're not the type that President uh, Trump alludes to. They're actually not real polls. They're not guided by the same transparency, the same goals, and everything else that even some of the organizations who are doing online polls are trying to accomplish in a legitimate way. And speaking of polls that are not exactly the gold standard, there is this incredible story involving big media organizations, a reputable uh, data organization, and the NFL, the kind of gold standard of of sports, that has emerged. I I love this story, Lee. I cannot believe this is actually true, though, but it is. Yeah. So what happened? Yeah, believe your own eyes on this one. So so J.D. Power, a very reputable organization with a great brand, uh, they wanted to find out, are people watching football less? And is if so, what's the reason? And does it trace to the controversy over Colin pa- Kaepernick last year uh, in terms of you know his protests over the you know sitting uh, taking a knee for the national anthem? And they found and was reported extensively in the media, which is a uh, you know big question mark for us also um, that in fact they argued that people were watching less football, and the reason was because of his protest. So so this was a big story, especially in, in some conservative media, but it yes. certainly got its play on the Today Show and other places. Yes, when it, be- he- it became an ideological political football, as right. it were. Right, yeah, it, it mixed, the one thing you never do is is mix uh, politics and, and football or sports, and that's what happened here. Yeah. It's It was a huge story for a long period of time, and so J.D. Power basically goes out and surveys people and says, yep, people are watching less football because of this one controversy? Well, I think what we have here is an example of not just bad polling, but a combination of bad polling and bad reporting. So talk about the bad polling first. What did they do wrong? What hap- How did they get this result? That's a really good question. <laughs> we'll because have to it, invite because the you know what we, we, you know, we, we, we did that. we did drill down and they interviewed 9200 fans, football fans. Oh, actually no, they were sports fans. Yeah, okay. um, overall, they were sports fans and they were people who had attended um, a, a sport uh, any kind of sporting event, professional sporting event over the past year. So they got 9200 people to say they attended and they asked them a bunch of questions about lots of different uh, lots of different sports, one of which being are they watching more or less football or about the same as they had before? And the real interest in this was because um, viewership was actually down. It was down in, in the first part Initially. of, of mm-hmm. the season. And it's funny because from the TV perspective, and I work you know, in, in media and journalism in the ad world, this was actually a huge story that in the first five or six weeks of the NFL season, viewership was down, which in our business was not because of Colin Kaepernick. The supposition was it was because of cord cutting, people abandoning their cable because it was too expensive and using you know, Roku and Apple TV and things like that where you can't get the NFL. That was the supposition. 
in our business is so I was happy. Right. But on the opinion side, they wanted to go to the source. They wanted to go to fans and ask, are, how, what are your viewing habits this time around? And what they found was that um, about, um, you know, a proportion of people said that they were viewing less. And I'm going to hold off on what that proportion is because that's a really big deal. Um, and then they what asked a, that. What a tease. And they asked those people, okay, so why are you watching less? And a quarter of them said uh, that they were watching less because of the Kaepernick protest. Were they, at, I mean, was that a multiple choice or did they offer that up? No, they didn't volunteer. It was actually from a list of choices. Other things they could have said was, you know, the the domestic violence incidents. Um, that also got uh, almost a quarter, 24 percent. Which um, could have been the headline in and of itself because it was the same number of people pretty much who answered that. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong was with this very survey? wrong with it. As I mentioned, it was a subsample of that 9,200 people. Only 12 percent of those 9,200 said that they were watching football less. And in fact, 27% of them said that they were watching it more. Headline again, people watching more football. So Lee, that's, so, so this result comes out and did J.D. Power pump up this, this argument that because of Colin Kaepernick, people are watching less football or was that something that the media pulled out of it? Because sometimes that happens. Well, I think their report the headline, headline. The headline was that Kaepernick was responsible for yeah. the decline in viewership. So J.D. Power goes out and sells this as the story. It lands on newsroom desks mm-hmm. all over the country. And who picks, <laughs> who picks it up, Lee? The media. Oh, well, USA, Today. USA Today. USA Today has a, has yeah. a huge story Although on Kaepernick. ES, and ESPN. <laughs> Yeah, I mean every bit. I mean, really, all traditional media, not and so, Watch, you know, Washington and Post, media. to their credit, ripped it apart. So well, I mean, after, we did see it, after, after, the fact. after the fact. But here, after one, the one fact. more, one more, turning the page on the numbers. If you take the people who are watching football less and the people who said it was because of this protest, you're only talking about three percent of the actual number of people they talked to. And that's 287 people out of the 9,200. So you're making a real mountain out of a really tiny molehill out of this. So that'll do it for this edition of Poll Hub. Please send questions to us. We'd love to hear from you to pollhub at maris.edu. And you can check out Poll Hub on social media, on Twitter at Maris Poll, on Facebook, Maris Poll also, Snapchat, Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe, because right. then we'll be totally, that was great, totally, in you, totally that was good. Uh, on you. We purposely gave that to Lee, the social stuff, just to see how he did yeah, I thought it, you, it. You nailed it. Yeah, and it says in my notes, and don't forget to subscribe. But I didn't say and as if those were my notes. On New Year's, say Happy New Year's. On Christmas, say Merry Christmas. I didn't include that. We're going to work on that for next week. That's Paul Hope. Have a good weekend. <laughs>